So there's some typical Poisson, I'm sorry, uh, typical Yelks modules for different rocks. So sandstone, limestone, and shale. The colors represent the porosity values with the light colors being low porosity uh, and, the, and the darker colors being high porosity. And so, you know, this is not against your tuition. If, if a material is very porous, it means it has a lot of air in it, right? But when we measure the material, when we go to the lab and we test the rock, there's no way to test it. I mean, the pores are much, much smaller than any sample we can test, right? So there's no way to have a, a, a rock that doesn't have pores in it. They all do, right? There's no way we can test a sample small enough. So, so there's no way to neglect it. So when we're, when we're testing the material properties, we're testing really these sort of bulk material properties, right? The constituents of the rock and the air that's in it. Well, of course, air is, you know, doesn't provide much resistance to deformation. It would be kind of hard to move around if it did, right? So, so therefore, when we, you know, a material that has uh, a high porosity uh, is going to always, typically always have a lower modulus. Right? So uh, there's more air in it, less resistance to deformation. Uh, it, it's just um, like bin number, so it's like number of number of types of shale, number of limestone. Because you know, limestone and sandstone is a pretty broad generalization. Indiana limestone, whatever. So these were sort of number of different limestones taken from the literature versus their. So it's just sort of to give you an idea. You know, you know, apparently limestone is very can have a very large spread in, in uh, Yolks modules. So modulus values in SI units, will always, they should always be on the order of gigapascal. Okay. 10 to the minus 9 pascal. So Poisson ratios, typical values of Poisson ratios. Uh, this is pretty consistent for most rocks. I mean, I think if you don't know any better, if you don't actually have a measurement, you know, if you, if you assume something about 0.2 for a rock, it's, it's probably okay, you know. So most, most rocks seem to be sort of the average of, if you averaged all three of these, it'd probably be close to 0.2. That's a bit about right. Um, what about steel? What, does anybody know what steel? The, uh, Poisson ratio of steel is? It's about 0 0.3, 0 0.33. No. It's about 0.33. Also, just, just to give you another, you know, go back to the, to the modulus values. Does anybody know what the modulus value of steel is? It's about, about 200 GPA. About 200. So steel is about twice as thick as rock. So, so those were properties that came from the comparing individual components of the stress to individual components of the strain, right? So remember, there's nine values of stress, there's nine values of strain. So I just showed you four properties that compared, you know, one, one, of, one of each value or just proportional to one of each value. So we have this thing called generalized Hooke's Law. And while I said there's nine stress values, that, that, that's true because stress is a tensor, of course. But what's, there's something special about both the stress and the strain tensor that makes it where it's not really nine. Independ there's not nine unique values. There's only what? There's only six due to the symmetry. There's only six unique values due to the symmetry. Okay. So uh, given the six unique values, we can write a constitutive model in sort of a matrix form. And so what's on the left here, you notice that there's a vector sign over that. So that's a stress vector. And the order matters here, but we're gonna so we're gonna write down the six unique components, okay? So the six unique 
components would be the 1-1, one, one, the 2-2, two, two, the 3-3, three, 1-2, three, one, 2-3. Two, one, three, two, three. And then there's a matrix here. And then the strain here is also a vector, six unique components, and that's going to have epsilon 1, 1, epsilon 2, 2, epsilon 3, 3, 2, epsilon 1, 2, 2, epsilon 1, 3, 2, epsilon 2, 3. And so this is C, all right? So how big is C? C, if it, C is a matrix, how many entries does it have? 36 then, right? 36 entries. So remember, on the previous slide, I was just comparing, like, E was, e was epsilon 1, 1, uh, sigma 1, 1, and so you had an entry there, right? So that means I need to, I have to go to the lab. So that just comes from one experiment, right? I, I pull on, I pull on my rock in the epsilon 1, 1 direction, and I measure the force in that direction, and I can come up with the material property that goes there. Then I have to go back to the lab, and I have to do the same thing in the 2, 2 direction, the same thing in the 3, 3 direction, then I have to measure all the shear strains, then I have to measure the bulk moduli, and I have to do 36 independent experiments to fully populate this. Well, it's not quite true. It turns out, and we're not going to go into the details, but it turns out, due to the symmetry of the stress and the strain, and then some energy arguments, basically there's some constraints. Uh, there's some constraints placed on the constitutive model by thermodynamics. With that, we can actually lower this from 36 down. We can show that there are actually 21 independent, 21 independent constants. Okay, so that would be the topic of a graduate course in elasticity. You go through all those arguments. Right? So there are 21 in to fill this guy up. There are 21 independent constants, which means that you'd have to go to the lab and do 21 independent tests. Now, you guys just did a lab. Do you measure you measured the X modulus, right? So imagine now you have to do 20 more tests to fully characterize the rock in a variety of configurations and other things. Right? But if the if the material, and we're talking about rocks, if the, if the material has any plane of symmetry, like wood is a great example of this. Um, you know, uh, wood, I mean, most of you probably know from experience that this, you know, wood is, is much stronger if you pull in the, at, in the direction of the grain versus if you, you know, deform it against, in the you know, transverse to the grain. This is why guys can you know, karate chop through. <laughs> 10 blocks of wood, right? Because they're, they're going th through the grain. They could never do it. If you, if you turn those blocks on end, they could never do it, right? It's too stiff in that direction. So wood is a perfect example. It, it is much stronger in one direction than the other two. And it turns out it has a, has a plane of symmetry. Um, it has at least one plane of symmetry. And so you can characterize wood with fewer than 21 constants, OK? And then there are other materials. Composite materials are, are um, a good example of a transversely isotropic material. So usually, you know, like a composite material like you'd find in your car hood or something, made of carbon fiber or something like that. It's going to have the same strength in this direction and the same strength in this direction, but it's going to be weaker in that direction. Right? So that's typical of a composite material. And a, a material that's transversely isotropic, you can actually reduce this 21 down to 5, 5 independent costs. If a material is, has infinite planes of symmetry, meaning it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter at all uh, if I bend it this way or bend it that way, bend it this way. If they're 
completely isotropic. They have infinite planes of symmetry. Most metals are good, can you know, fairly well be approximated like this. Then in that case, uh, it goes all the way down to two independent constants. Two independent constants. Right. And so did you guys in the lab measure Poisson ratio? No. So I mean, that's another easy one to get. You can, because you can sort of get that in one test, right? If I have a, if I have a bar, and I pull on it, and I put a strain gauge here, that's going to give me the axial strain, and I can measure the force, and therefore I can get the Young's modulus. That's what you guys did. You, you pushed on it. But I can also put a strain gauge this way. So if I put a strain gauge this way, if I put a strain gauge this way, now I can measure the, the, the reduction or the, the transverse strain. And in one test, I can get the Poisson ratio. Because the Poisson ratio is going to be the ratio of that strain to that strain. So in one test, I can get both material properties for an isotropic material. How do you put the vertical one on there? Yeah, I mean, you could affix it to the sample. Well, glue it, yeah. yeah. Um, you have to, it has to be done very carefully such that, you know, you're not testing the strength of the glue, uh, or that you're, you're in fact, testing the, uh, you know, the actual strength of the rock. Uh, you know, this is a sort of classical way to do it with strain gauges. Nowadays, uh, we can do this optically, actually, quite well. Uh, laser interferometry, or, or now there's also a technique called digital image correlation, which basically just with a digital camera, probably your iPhone takes high enough quality pictures that you can, you know, if you have enough contrast, which most rocks actually do have a lot of contrast just naturally, then, then you can actually use computer software to track the changes in contrast through the deformation. And you can get very accurate. You know, you can get down to like one ten thousandth of the resolution of the camera in terms of deformation. And so, I wonder if anybody's doing that. That'd be pretty cool to like do some d digital image correlation with just an iPhone. I I'm pretty sure the camera is probably high enough quality that you can do it. So we all have ex little labs in our pocket. Um, Yeah, so for isotropic materials, these are what the entries look like. So that's in terms of that's in terms of Young's modulus and Poisson ratio. We can write this equation really compactly, uh, going back to so this is sort of a vector notation. Notice these are vectors, matrix, vector. Uh, we can go back to our sort of tensor notation, uh, and we can write this equation pretty compactly. So this is the stress tensor our little three by three matrix. Uh, and in this case, I'm writing it the bulk modulus times the volumetric strain times the, uh, the identity matrix. So that's also a three by three with entries only along the diagonal, because the identity matrix is just ones on the diagonal. I'm taking a constant. K epsilon volume is a constant, and I multiply it along the diagonal of the identity matrix. And then with to that, I add in two times the shear modulus times the total strain tensor minus the volumetric part. So this is this quantity, that total quantity right there is called the deviatoric strain. So it's a measure of the shear strain of the material. So this is like, sometimes you'll see it written like that, ED. It's a measure of the shear strain. And these are tensor quantities. Right. And here's the relation between E and new in the shear strain. Another way you might see it written is like this. So these two, all three of these equations are equivalent. This is probably the most compact way you can write it. And so we introduce a new parameter. It's called Lemay's parameter, which we don't typically measure directly in any way. 
uh, but it does have this relationship. But we like we like it because we, do, we can write the equation really compactly. Right? We don't have all this nonsense. It's just Lemay's constant times the volumetric strain times the identity matrix plus two times uh, the shear modulus times the strain intensity. So. So they're, for isotropic materials, we talked about bulk modulus, Young's modulus, shear modulus, and Poisson ratio in terms of their physical quantities. We also gave l l the lambda, which is a maze constant, uh, you know, it's just a sort of a convenience parameter that has a relationship between the other two. Uh, there's also this one, which is like the seismic modulus, M. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, this is sort of what, what you could infer from um, borehole seismic measurements. And uh, then they're all related to one another, right? So there's this table, and this is, in fact, just half the table. Um, there's the other half. And so, you know, if you're given any two, if you're given any two and you need to know the other one, you can just read it off the table. <laughs> And uh, you know, I, I provided this for reference. You can, I think you can also find this on Wikipedia. Or there's other references um, for this type of thing. So then, just the last thing is the the M. That M is, uh, you know, if you measure the P wave, okay, then this is the sort of equation for the bulk wave P wave speed. And so, you know, the way you could come up with M from you know, borehole seismic measurements is you measure V, right, and you know the density, or you measure the density, and so then you can solve this equation to get M. So you get a value for M. And this is the shear wave speed, right? So, you know, the, the wave speed of uh, or the shear wave is the bulk modulus, the square root of the bulk modulus over the density. That, that's the shear wave speed. Okay. So we'll stop there and see you Monday.